Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us today for the BabyAge.com Car Seat Safety Birth to Booster webinar. Joining us today is Sarah Tilton, the Child Passenger Safety Advocate for Britex. Sarah is the spokesperson for Britex within the advocacy community participating in child passenger safety activities at a local, state, and national level. With that being said, I'd like to hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you. So uh, our children are our most precious cargo, and of course we want to make sure that we um, are not only abiding by the legal requirements, um, because as we'll talk further, legal requirements um, do not always meet what's best practice or that blue ribbon level of protection for our children. So we ask ourselves why car seats, and I'm sure we've all heard this from our um, grandparents, maybe even our parents, um, you know, we didn't use car seats when you were young. So why now? Well, child restraints provide or prevent injury five different ways. And the first being um, preventing ejection from the vehicle. The ultimate purpose of a car seat or a vehicle seat belt is to keep the occupant within the compartment of the vehicle for protection. Our vehicles are designed to absorb energy during that crash event. Child restraints and seat belts contact the strongest parts of our body. The five-point harness within a child restraint contacts our hip bones or the child's hip bones. The shoulder harnesses come over the child's collarbone, shoulder bones. Our bones are the strongest structure points of our body as opposed to our flesh and tissue. With that, the harness and its width and its contact spreads the forces over a wider area of our body. So when that force is applied, the larger the area that the force is applied to, the injury becomes much less. Child restraints and seat belts help our body to ride down the crash. Basically, we want our body to slow down as the vehicle slows down. For those of us who are familiar with Newton, uh, Newton's law and those things in motion or objects in motion stay in motion until something stops it. So if we don't have our seatbelt on or we're not in a child restraint, um, the car comes to a stop when it hits that, um, when the crash event occurs before the body. The body then doesn't stop until it hits the interior of the vehicle. Um, and as well, um, protecting the head and spinal cord for the um, child and adult because those are some very important organs for us that often cannot be repaired. So the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, has broken that down into four basic steps for the appropriate transportation for children. And those four steps are rear-facing, forward-facing, booster mode, and then moving into a seat belt. And we're going to take a look today um, just briefly at some best practices for each one of those steps and when it's appropriate to move from one step to the next. Typically for the first, uh, or for the child, the first car seat that they will start with um, is an infant only seat or an infant seat such as you see here. These types of seats are meant only for rear-facing use. Best practice is that these seats are used to their maximum um, weight and or height allowed by the manufacturer of the specific seat that you're using. And they have some other fitment um, requirements as to how the child should physically fit in there. The harness height, um, where the head should be located, in rel uh, relativity to the seat shell, and we'll look at some of those other things um, here in just a moment. The next step would be a convertible, keeping that child rear-facing. 
convertibles on the market today will go anywhere from 25, 22 to 35 pounds maximum rear-facing weight capacity. When we move into the convertible range, we have products in the market from various manufacturers that go as high as 35, 40, 45 pounds rear-facing. And again, we want to use this seat rear-facing until the seat um, can no longer accommodate the child's weight, height, or physical fitment requirements that are determined by the child restraint manufacturer themselves. Once that child meets those requirements and the Academy of P American Academy of Pediatrics um, chimes in here and recommends that children stay rear-facing as long as possible the minimum is one year and 20 pounds. At that point, it is legally acceptable to turn the child forward facing, but we know from studies that it is best that they remain rear facing as long as possible. The American Academy of Pediatrics released information last year that indicates a child is five times safer riding rear-facing through their second year of life. Um, we as parents um, start to think, such as this little boy here, that he's uncomfortable, his legs are hitting the back of the seat. Um, that's really our perception that he's uncomfortable. He doesn't know any different yet until we turn him forward-facing. Um, they remember they spent nine months in the womb, so they're going to figure out what to do with their their legs. Um, there are no reported cases of leg injury from extended rear facing that I'm aware of, but as we know, turning them forward facing too soon can result in head spinal cord injury. So keep them rear-facing in that seat convertible as long as possible. Not all parents choose to use an inf infant carrier. Um, most convertibles start at five pounds. So in all reality, for um, various reasons, you could simply start with a convertible rear-facing. So let's Sarah, take a look. Sarah, we have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, one of our attendees, we're told that the infant seat is best in the rear, uh, the rear center seat, and they're having trouble securing the base in that middle seat because of the latch hook. Okay. Any advice on how they can get a good fit in the middle seat, or are the side seats okay? They well, have that's... Oh, That's a very good question. Um, the rear center seating position is perceived to be the safest seating position in a vehicle for a child because it is the furthest from side impact coming from either side, passenger or driver. Unfortunately, um, with one child and your vehicle, you can encounter situations with vehicle seat contour being the shape, um, uh, the width of your vehicle, even though your vehicle, your center seating position is um, designated as a seating position, um, unfortunately they often tend to be narrower than your outboard positions. So you have um, various compatibility between vehicle design and child restraint interaction that unfortunately does not always permit a child restraint to be installed in the center seating position. Um, if it has a seat belt more times than not in the center seating position, um, that is what you want to use is the seat belt, not the latch system, um, unless your vehicle per, um, specifically offers latch in your center seating position. Latch is only typically offered in two seating positions of vehicles, and they are typically in the outboard. Now, there are some that do offer center seating position latch, but it is not across the board. So I hope that helps to address that question. The question um, while we're on here, can you explain what CRS and CR stand for? Ah, yes, thank you. CR is child restraint. CRS is child restraint system. Great. Thank you. You're welcome.
So let's take a look at um, rear facing and where the harness should be. So when we um, when you put your child into the car seat and you tighten up the harness and we are the child is rear facing, the harness should be coming out of the seat shell at or slightly below the child's shoulders. 